No my hi my welcome to the More Than Theology podcast. My name is Grace Chamberlain. I'm the academic dean here at Pathways College. And today I have the privilege of talking with Dr. Richard Goodwin, who is my colleague here at Pathways College. Uh, he's the academic director. And he has just recently written this book, Seen is Believing. For those who can see it, this is the cover. And for those who are listening, just trust me. It is called Seeing is Believing. And um, yeah, it, it's my privilege today to get to talk to Richard about this book and, um, and to learn something about uh, his research and, and what he has discovered and wants to share with us about theology and film. Hi, yeah, Richard. Cool. Kia ora, Grace. How's it going? Yeah, good. How are you? Cool. How are you going? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah. And great. Happy to be here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. great to be Norm- here. Normally, I'm on the other side of the microphone, so to speak, um, doing the yes. questioning. So, yeah, it's fun to be on the other side. Yeah. I mean, this time you just sort of get to respond to questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't have to come up with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, well, um, I'd love to launch in with the first question, which is just what is this book about? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's about, well, I mean, the subtitle that the publisher has given it is The Revelation of God Through Film. Mm. Um, and that's certainly a big part of it. It's about, um, you know, is it possible that God reveals God's self through something as kind of seemingly profane and mundane as movies? Mm. Um, and, and you know, I think, yes, um, God can reveal God's self. God can speak through um, movies along with all sorts of other parts of life. And um, that's not, the full story, though, that's um, and I'm not the first person to say that, so that's not what the um, entire book looks at. But then it goes further and it looks at, okay, so how does that happen? And I think this is probably um, mm. territory that has been a little bit underexplored in the kind of theology and film um, field because uh, for good reasons, I think, which is that revelation is mysterious and revelation mm. um you, it can't be proven and revelation um is god's doing um god is the primary agent mm. of revelation um but what's kind of interesting to me is that certain movies um are the sort of when when film theology and film people get together or they write books um and have conversations they tend to cite certain movies as being like oh man that was Revelatory. That was God speaking yeah. to me. I really sensed something more there. And, and some movies seem to do that more than others. And so I started wondering, I guess, what is it that about mm. these films that tend to uh, invite that kind of response or set the, set the scene uh, for that kind of divine encounter to happen? Um, and so that's, yeah, what I wanted to do and specifically wanted to focus on the role of images and mm. emotion. So I kind of think of that. Uh, in fact, this book started out life as a doctoral thesis. So it was my PhD thesis. And the subtitle for it was um, Revelation, Emotion, and Film Images. Mm-hmm. So that subtitle has changed now that it's been published. But I think of those as still the three main pillars of the book, Revelation, mm. Emotion, and Film Images. Yeah. Yeah. So in your book, uh, you, you argue that... There are some movie watching experiences that could be classed as general revelation, and um, if we simply shifted our our understanding a little bit of what general revelation was, then that that would become clear. So, what is general re- revelation, mm. and what does it have to do with movies? Yeah. So, first of all, backing up just one step from that is you know mm. revelation is God revealing God's self to us. And that's how we Mm. know anything about God. Um, And so the question is, well, how do we know who God is or what God is like? Um, And our best answer for that is it's through the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, And in a kind of reflective kind of way, the scriptures, um, the Bible tells us who Jesus is, tells the story Mm. of Jesus or story of Israel that culminates in Jesus. Um, And uh, that is, um, though, so when we're talking about that kind of revelation, that is what theologians have sometimes classed as special revelation. Yes. Mm. Um, but there are other forms of uh, revelation. There are other kinds of not, um, ways that we can learn or and understand something about God that doesn't come from 
uh, Jesus or knowing who Jesus is doesn't come from the scriptures um, and yet can still um, be true. And mm. um, this is what uh, theologians have traditionally called general revelation, or at least some theologians, especially in the Protestant tradition. And so um, examples of this would be like, you know, probably kind of classic examples would be um, nature, you know, mm-hmm. or, or we yeah. would generally say as Christians, creation. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that creation itself um, s- speaks of God's reality in some sort of way. Now, you can't um, look at a beautiful mountain um, or landscape from the top of a mountain or look at the night sky or watch, um, you know, baby deer frolic in the meadows Mm. um, and necessarily know that, you know, there is a God who loves us and stepped into creation and the person of Jesus Christ and so on and so on and so on. You don't get Mm. that specific detail, but you Mm. might still um, have a sense that, oh, there's there's some sort of creator or there is some sort of being out there, or there is some sorts of there's some sort of more to life mm. beyond what um, Charles Taylor called the imminent frame. You know, so sure. um, that is uh, what theologians have called general revelation. Mm. I'll just give you um, a couple of scriptural examples um, in the book of Acts when um, Paul. Uh, wants to talk to pagans. When he talks to his Jewish audience, he talks. He refers to the scriptures, so he refers to their sort of form of special revelation. But mm-hmm. when he starts talking to, uh, you know, Greeks who have not grown up hearing um, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, they don't, or they don't um, see it as being authoritative or revelatory. Instead, he appeals to the revelation that they do have. So in Acts fourteen, he talks. He refers to. Um, the crops that they have and rain mm. that comes in its season and the joy in their hearts. And when it, um, when it comes to Acts 17, a few chapters later, he's in, the, in Athens and he quotes um, Greek poets um, and takes what they've said about God and, um, and kind of embeds that in the story of Jesus. And so those are examples where um, Paul is able to see that these people, these pagans, do have some... Mm. revelation of God. They do have some insight into God. They might It might be mixed up with all sorts of other stuff, and yeah. it's certainly not enough to get them all the way to Jesus. Um, but he uses that as a platform to build on. So that, yes. is, that, is what, um, that is general revelation. And what I'm arguing is that when we um, have, you know, we have a divine encounter while watching a film, mm. that that may be a form of, uh, general revelation, if we're willing to, yeah, like I said, sort of tweak our definition a little bit of general revelation. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as you were speaking about, you know, looking out at creation and not not quite, you know, getting all the details, well, in fact, not getting all the details of mm. who this God is and, and what he has done, but... Um, what we do get, I believe, in general revelation is sometimes that sense of, of something that takes our breath away and, and makes yeah. us go, oh, something, yeah. there's something transcendent happening here. That's right, um, yeah. And, mm. yeah, I love that you said that um, because I remember um, I was reading a book on general revelation by uh, th- theologian Bruce Demarest, and I remember him mm. saying that the, um, the Puritans – thought of general revelation as quite dry and Mm. cold and special revelation um, as warm and sort of Mm. personal. And I get where they're coming from, but this is partly what I wanted to, um, yeah, kind of introduce into our thinking about general revelation is this more um, emotional and warm Mm. dimension to general revelation. It it does um, sometimes take our Mm. breath away. It can be Mm. um, awe-inducing. It can um, inspire wonder. And these are emotions that I explore a little bit in this book um, with reference Mm. to general revelation. So, yeah, I think that that's an important part of um, not all general revelation, but some of it for sure. Yeah. So in your book as well, you've, you proposed a model which you call the Bethel paradigm of revelation. And mm. what is that? <laughs> Can you explain that yeah. to us? Yeah. So it comes from Genesis chapter 28, and that's the story mm. of um, Jacob as running from Esau. And 
uh, as he's running from Esau, he just lies down on the side of the road and falls mm. asleep. And this is in Nowheresville. Like this is, uh, he's not in a, he's not in a temple. He's not in a place where mm. he would expect God to be present. Um, but while he's asleep, he has a dream. And in this dream, um, he sees, the, you know, some of you will know it as Jacob's Ladder, um, angels mm. ascending and descending up and down a sort of ladder-like structure and um, or a staircase. And mm. um, and he wakes up and he says, surely the Lord is in this place. Um, yeah. Sorry, how awesome is this place? Surely the Lord was in this place and I was not aware of it. Mm. And um, and so what's interesting to me and what's relevant to this topic um, about this is that it's obvi- obvious from this text that it's possible to be in God's presence and not know it. It's possible that yes. God is revealing God's self and we're not aware of it. Mm. Um, and something happened in Jacob's awareness that shifted. It mm. wasn't that um, God wasn't there and then suddenly God turned up. It was that God was already revealing God's self and Jacob was able to sort of tune in, almost like a radio broadcast. You know, radio broadcast, the, the radio waves are all around you and you just need that that radio to tune in in the right frequency mm. and then you can hear what is being said. And so something about this experience was, enabled Jacob to tune in to what God yes. was saying or just God's presence, um, which is a form of revelation. Mm. And the reason why um, I think this is helpful for us in thinking about Revelation through film is because, mm. like I said earlier, we can't say. Um, I think this might, we might have been. I might have said this actually earlier before we started um, recording. So, for the benefit <laughs> of our audience, um, Grace and I were just talking a little earlier about the fact that we can't. Um, we can't say that God has. Um, his hand has been forced that we can't say yeah. that we create revelation in any sort of way. Mm. So a filmmaker can't just, um, you know, do this kind of shot and put this kind of music over it <laughs> and use this kind of lighting and Hey, presto, we've got revelation. Um, mm. because it's not a technique. It's not something that we get to manufacture. Um, mm. if revelation is going to be revelation, then it's God's doing. God is the primary agent of revelation. Um, mm. and so that means that, you know, this this question of like, why do some movies sort of um, become the occasion for revelation more often than others um, is a little bit kind of mysterious. And so um, mm. on the other hand, um, God can speak through anything, mm. but it seems to be certain movies do it more than others. And I think the, the Genesis 28 narrative, the Bethel paradigm of um, revelation, helps us understand that because mm. what we can say is that movies can help shift our awareness or they yeah. invite us to shift our awareness um, to those areas of reality, creation, whatever, life, that God, mm. um, through which God is already speaking or already um, able to be sensed, if you like. Um, mm. And so that's where an image and emotion come in. Yes. Um, because then we can say, okay, well, these certain kinds of movies use images and a whole lot of other things, um, mm. story and music and all that, but I focus on images, and um, to, to invite certain kinds of emotional responses from the viewers. Mm. And those um, a- emotions work like a searchlight. They, they direct our attention to certain parts of the environment and not others. Mm-hmm. And so whatever emotion um, these films invite from the audience, they may act like a searchlight and shift our awareness to those parts of life and reality and creation and all that, um, Mm -hmm. where God is already revealing God's self. And so um, that is where the, the... the Bethel kind of paradigm becomes a kind of way of thinking about revelation that movies invite us into a space where we can tune into the broadcast, if you like, of what God is already saying. It's our aware movies help us shift our awareness. Mm. And so we can hear what God is um, saying or just sense that God is present. Mm. Yeah, that's, that is so cool. I I love that particular verse. I actually have it um, written on a post-it note and and, um, stuck at the corner of my monitor. Surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. And I think Mm. that's um, quite a, a big (laughs) revelation actually to realize that, uh, that God is present 
in places and in films and um you know god is present in in a lot of spaces that we don't expect god to show up yeah mm. yeah absolutely and i think it's really important in our day and age too because you know um we wring our hands um as mm -hmm. believers about the fact that our culture is becoming increasingly secular yeah. um and you know i think that's a uh, fear to note that to discuss it to gr grieve it sometimes mm -hmm. um but also to recognize that that doesn't mean that the holy spirit is any less present in the world and any less active um but it might mean that we need to be open to the fact that god might be showing up to use kind of evangelical parlance um in places <laughs> that um we traditionally haven't really been so open to um mm. and that to me is really what's fascinating is to think you know okay people maybe aren't going to church in the numbers that they used to people aren't reading the bible in the numbers mm. that they used to people aren't ticking christian in the in the census like they used to does that mean that um that god is no longer active and the answer, of course, is no, that God is mm. is active, but we've got to learn to see and discern yes. where the Spirit is active in these kind of non-traditional spaces. And so to me, you know, yes, my book is about movies and it's quite niche, mm. um, but there are wider questions too that this taps into, which is about like, where is God at work in our culture? Where is God at yes. work in our, our unbelieving friends and neighbors' um, lives? And how can we kind of be have our own sorts of understanding about God's activity shaken up enough that we're able to mm. see that and be open to that? Yeah, yeah. And that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. But I yeah. think that's some of the – I mean, like, that's probably it, – it's more implicit in my book, you know, like mm. um, I don't go on those kind of tangents. I keep it pretty tight around, you know, the film. Mm film viewing experiences, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't take much imagination to go from that to, you know, these bigger sort of life questions. In fact, um, recently, um, since the book has been released, a few home groups in my church um, have asked me to come and present about it. And yeah. I've been um, pleased, I guess, at how he easily and quickly people start making connections from this stuff to all sorts of aspects of life. Yeah. Mm. And that's, I think, a really, uh, it's a big part of what, you know, what we do, uh, at Pathways or in theological education is we learn <laughs> sometimes these very interesting things. Or I, I mean, I think it's interesting. <laughs> you, you think it's Thank interesting. You. Hopefully everybody listening thinks and, and watching <laughs> thinks it's interesting as well. But we learn these things and, uh, we have to then take them and actually apply them to life. And so, that, um, yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just gonna gonna say, um, how do we do that? How do we take what we are learning and actually then apply it? Well, I don't know if I've got any great answers for how we do that in a general sense, but um, mm. I think for me, like there are some sort of applications that come from this book. So if yes. that was helpful, maybe I could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's all sorts of directions you could take it. I mean, if we're just going to stick to the sort of subject matter at hand, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, people, uh, it would be great if people were um, open to the possibility that God might um, be speaking to them through through movies and through mm -hmm. the arts in general. And um, I know that there are some people, some listeners and viewers that probably already are very aware of that, but some of us have not been encouraged to think about the arts that way. Um, mm. And so we've sometimes thought of maybe the arts as sort of, well, you can get a good moral lesson from it, um, mm -hmm. but not as something that God's going to really like meet you there, you know, um, mm. especially if it's sort of like quote unquote secular art. But, yes. it, you know, I mean, a kind of a newsflash, I guess, is there is no real sacred secular divide. You know, God created this world uh, good, mm. and that includes the physical as well as the spiritual. Now, it's a fallen mm. world, but that doesn't mean that anything kind of physical or non-spiritual or whatever is somehow um, off limits or a distraction or unhelpful, um, mm. not necessarily. And so 
Um, I think it would be cool for some people to go away from this book or this podcast or whatever and be more attuned to how God might... Um, they might encounter God through the arts, through movies, um, and um, that's not something you can manufacture. It's not something that I think even happens very often for me personally. Um, but what's? Um, but you might even look back on experiences that you've had and sort of say, oh, maybe that was God. You know, I thought of that as yeah. just a kind of powerful moment, but maybe mm. in retrospect God was actually there speaking to me or something like that. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's... That is um, one takeaway. I think another takeaway would be more specific to like Christian filmmakers and Christian artists, which is um, encouraging them to think not just about the message that they're trying to convey, but also maybe the kind of experience they want to invite people into. Again, you mm. can't manufacture revelation, but you can invite people into a place that might make them more open to God, the reality of God. Um yes. And then the final um, sort of takeaway, not to limit things, but just keeping things succinct, um, mm. I'd say just going back to what I was saying before, which is kind of going beyond um, going beyond movies and the arts um, and just thinking about general revelation and the fact that God speaks through all these um, other channels in creation and, and in life. Um, and I think that's really enriching for us um, to to our own faith to be more attuned to that. But it's also mm. a great um, way for us to, I think, engage with our culture because mm. a little bit like Paul, we most of the time um, these days, if we're speaking to a non-Christian audience, just say the Bible says such and such doesn't mm. carry a whole lot of authority. Um, mm -hmm. It's not to say that we don't use the Bible. We're, we'll probably we'll get there eventually. But maybe we initially need to start kind of going... God, look where God is already present in your world, just like Paul did mm. in Acts 14 and Acts 17, and picking out the way the experiences that people were maybe already having of God. Um, they might mm. not call it God, or they might not they might interpret it slightly differently. But if we're yeah. able to help them see that um, as the church, I think we'll be better placed to engage with and reach our culture um, in this sort of cultural moment where people are more secularized and but sometimes mm. you know describing themselves as uh, spiritual but not religious yes not going to yeah. church not reading the bible but still believing in something more and we can tap into that if we're able to discern where the spirit's at work mm. Mm. yeah yeah thank you richard yeah. uh it's been wonderful talking with you, and I'd like to just ask one more question to yeah. um, mm -hmm. to wrap up our conversation, and that is, could you give us a, an example or a story of a time that you've had uh, an emotional response and, and a sense that God is revealing himself to you through a film? Yeah, sure. I was, um, well... There's a couple that come to mind. One is watching a film called Magnolia, which I don't recommend mm. in the sense that it's quite a um, R-rated movie and it's right. the kind of thing that a lot of people would find um, a difficult watch. And so mm. um, please don't take this as an endorsement to just necessarily go away and watch it. But it is one of these films mm. that a lot of um, Christian film lovers often point to as, wow, God spoke to me through that film. So, mm. you know, God can speak through these films that, um, yeah, not the kind of movies you'd watch show at a youth group night, but mm. um, and nevertheless can be powerful um, instruments in God's hands, if you like. Um, mm. But uh, I talk about that a bit in the book, so I might not go into depth on that one. Um, but another one that um, comes to mind is uh, in response to the film The Tree of Life. Um, and it's a funny one because it kind of polarizes audiences. So um, mm. when I was a seminary student living in Los Angeles, I, we were very poor and we usually could only afford to go to um, a second run movie theater, which is where they play mm. movies that have been out a couple of months and you just pay, it was, I think, $2. Um, oh, nice. This was, only, this was only like 10 years ago, so um, <laughs> it, it's probably gone up to like 3 or $4 now. But um so it was very cheap, and I was sitting there watching The Tree of Life, and I was just, it was about 20 minutes into the film, and I was just mm. entranced, um, and I think ultimately felt like that was a revelatory experience. But mm. um, and, and this is one that is kind of a, a classic example because it's one that, you know, books have re been written about this, this movie um, right. theologically. It's uh, one that a lot of um, 
people like me point to as, mm. you know, this really was the occasion for a divine encounter for me. And at the same time, yeah, 20, 30 minutes into the film, I saw a bunch of people just walking out of the theater. They just were so bored and, right. um, or just annoyed with it, you know? Mm. Um, and I was, I was on a podcast with, um, somebody the other day, I was a guest on a podcast and he was a great guy to talk to, but he, he didn't like the tree of life much. And he said, mm. you know, I, there's only so much whispering I can handle, you know, there's a lot of whispering in the film and, and, um, uh, it's just not everyone's. It's not everyone's uh, cup of tea. Mm. The reason why I think this is kind of interesting for this topic is it kind of captures both sides of the the puzzle that I'm trying to explore, which is like, um, on the one hand, there's no guarantees here. There's no yes. one film that goes, oh, revelation, this is just happens. You know, God still has to be speaking through it, and it's not always going to mm -hmm. Work for everyone, you know. Um, we come with our own sorts of tastes and experiences mm. and all sorts that we bring to uh, a movie that is sort of interaction. In interaction, but um, on the other hand, I'm not the only one that found this movie um, to be, you know, transcendent in this way. A lot yeah. of people do. So there seems to be a, something about how the film is made that is mm. invites that kind of response, but no, none of it is automatic. Ultimately, God still has to be revealing God's self to somebody in order for it to be revelation. Mm. So the tree of life, you're either going to love it or you'll hate it, right. um, but I'm on the love it side. Well, I'm going to go and watch it at some point in the next week, um, and I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 do let me know. That'll be cool to hear what you think. Unfiltered because... You, you can't offend me when it comes to movies, and um, and like I said, a lot of people don't like it. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Richard, uh, for mm. uh, yeah, telling us all about your book. And um, Richard, if people want to get a copy of this, where can they do that? Yeah, um, at the time of recording, um, I would mm. say one place you could get it is directly from the publisher, which is IVP Academic. Um, and mm -hmm. that'll come from the States. You can also look at um, Manor Books, um, and they I believe you can buy it online there. Um, I will also be hopefully have a few to sell online at richardvancegoodwin.com, but I think if you look at it right now, it, um, depending on when this uh, episode is actually released, it may not be live. So if you go to richardvancegoodwin.com and you find that the page is not live, then that... Um, maybe check out one of the other options, but mm. it's possible that that'll be live in the next few weeks, in which case you could get it there too. You can also get your book on Kindle from Amazon.com. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, I am an avid Kindle reader, and so if you just want to get it right away, um, mm -hmm. then you just get the Kindle version and it'll be there, Abracadabra, right away. Straight away. That's yep. how I got my copy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, and... Mm. Um, Thank you all for listening slash watching. Uh, great to have you with us. Yeah. Catch you later. Catch you later.